This is the European edition of Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. We bring you the European unicorn startups, founders, regulators, and leaders innovating the rapidly evolving fintech scene today. A truly localized podcast with both English and local language content with some of the world's most well-known hosts and influencers in the fintech sector globally. Join us every week as we explore what makes the European Union a phenomenal proving ground for many of the fastest growing fintech plays in the world today. Okay, let's roll. Hey guys, welcome to our new show. I am Matteo Rizzi, the executive producer of Breaking Banks Europe, and today I am super proud to introduce the kickoff episode of Breaking Payments. The one-liner, which is in between cheesy but certainly super true, is that payments are cool again, and we do have four amazing partners with us that are going to do two things. One, I hope to sort of demonstrate that what I just said is actually true uh, with, uh, um, how to say, uh, with the opinions from professionals, but also that uh, in the 12 episodes of this year, you're going to discover a business that you thought you knew, but maybe you don't really. So without further ado, let's give a couple of minutes to uh, each one of the speakers to introduce themselves. And I would start by James. James Allen, welcome to Breaking Payments. I can Thank say you, that. Matteo. Yeah, great to be here. Great to speak with you. Um, so yes, I'm James Allen. I look after the European market here at Payoneer. Um, Payoneer, you may have heard of, um, we call ourselves the world's go-to partner for digital commerce everywhere. Um, so we look at uh, borderless payments and boundless growth, uh, and we try and uh, promise any business in any market the technology, connections, and confidence uh, to flourish in this new global economy. Uh, so powering growth for customers ranging from aspiring entrepreneurs to emerging markets to world's leading digital brands, we try and offer this universe of opportunities to them. Thank you, James. And thanks again for sort of a belief in this, uh, in this show uh, uh, together, together with us. Uh, off to Keith. Keith from Plaid. Welcome back to the show. Actually, that's not your first time. That's right. It's great to be here, Matteo. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Keith Gross. I lead international for Plaid based out of London. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Plaid is one of the world's leading open banking platforms supporting North America, the UK, and Europe, and that includes open banking payments. So looking forward to talking about both what makes payments cool, but also how banking payments are part of that through open banking. So excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so off to another another James, uh, James Booth from Pipro. Welcome to the show. First time. Hi there, Matteo. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my name is James. I'm the head of partnerships for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at PPRO. Um, so at PPRO, we're an infrastructure provider for local payment methods. Uh, so we work indirectly in the market, uh, servicing payment service providers, gateways, global acquirers, giving them access to the most relevant local payment methods globally. Um, so we don't work with merchants directly, but we service hundreds of thousands of merchants around the world. Thank you. Thank you, James. And last but not least, of course, uh, Tamer, Tamer El Mari from uh, Tunes. So welcome to the show. And your Thanks background you. is not shaking at all. So Very good. Congrats. Very good. <laughs> so far, so good then. Uh, Mateo, thanks for the invite to join you and uh, the esteemed colleagues here. Um, for those who don't know Tunes, uh, Tunes is a uh, global network uh, that um, allows uh, businesses and their customers to move money across borders. We built a global network focused primarily on moving money in and out of emerging markets. Um, it is uh, a, a network that's uh, today focused on 125 countries and growing. Um, and uh, we are evolving that network to not only move money, but also collect money in markets uh, and layering on additional products like uh, compliance as a service. Uh, I'm the COO for Tunes and uh, thrilled to be with you here today, Matteo. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tamar. So, guys, we're 
actually, before you were, were talking, uh, I sort of have a deja vu uh, right now. You know, for I, I spent a few years at uh, at Swift in what it seems like uh, four generations ago, and we were building uh, InnoTribe, which is uh, the innovation initiatives, uh, the one of the first the fintech movements of the planet. And I'm talking about uh, 2007, 2008, right? So prehistory compared with uh, with now. And uh, back then, there were clearly like a, a bunch of guys that were like in the first month, right? And uh, the, or, or in other words, the banks back then who got it first, you know, who understood, for example, that they had to start interacting with these startups or that they understood that maybe building uh, a, an investment vehicle was a smart thing to do. And most importantly, that uh, they were not afraid of, uh, for example, uh, talking with entrepreneurs. And I'm today is BAU, but back then it wasn't uh, at all, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, as easy and uh, and as a no-brainer as it is uh, as it is today. So first of all, I want to salute these uh, four partners that are starting this new format with us. Not because uh, it's, you know, uh, not because they are sponsoring us, but because uh, they believe in this idea that uh, talking about what's possible, okay, in a field that is, uh, that has been, you know, evolving quickly, but is considered as monolithic from outside, it is actually an important, uh, an important thing to do. Uh, so the format of this show today, uh, you know, as you usually very uh, uh, informal, is going to be to like uh, pick these four brains uh, uh, on, on, on a couple of topics, but also with the touch of, uh, you know, their own uh, personal view on uh, basically why they joined the show and, and, and which type of topics uh, do they think uh, deserve, you know, the prime time on, uh, on Breaking Tech. And and I would like to 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 launch the first uh, uh, the first topic uh, that in one liner would be like uh, real time payments are getting real, you know, and uh, uh, and 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 the subtitle of this uh, of this one liner is the fact that uh, you know uh, uh, coming from an uh, 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 infrastructure company as a suite to this sort of a global market initiatives uh, like the SEPA back then uh, were sort of uh, uh, we are at very we were at the very forefront of this initiative. Uh, SEPA step two will allow uh, you know to reduce the payment processing time uh, from hours to uh, uh, minutes to seconds. Uh, that's the promise. Uh, by the fall this uh, this year, and uh, and it seems that this uh, uh, you know Swift as well you know brought this initiative uh, uh, the, the GPI and clearly the tendencies uh, shorten the processing time right is is how sort of how big of a trend uh, this is. Where is this more important, uh, more in a B two B or a B two C space? Uh, and what's your view? And what's your view on this? I would maybe start with uh, Tamer, you know, the last one to introduce himself, so to to give us his view, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll take it from there. Sure. Um, thanks, Matteo. Um, look, real time payments, fantastic trend. Uh, we're happy to see it coming to Europe. Uh, real time payments create more economic opportunities for entrepreneurs. Uh, they're going to add velocity velocity to um, the EU economy. Uh, I think a study that you had referenced when we were exchanging information uh, before the session looked at you know, the e economic impact of real-time payments. It identified many uh, short-term and long-term benefits um, from reducing uncertainty and increasing working capital, improving efficiency of financial systems, uh, driving financial inclusion. Um, but it's all not unique at the same time. There are roughly 70 local real-time payment networks in the world. Um, and we see, from a Tunes perspective, our role in connecting real-time payment networks and ensuring real-time payments between countries and continents. It's one thing to bring it to within a certain country, within a continent, um, but we see an interesting role in, in the connectivity across 
uh, countries and continents. And we think that in the future, um, all payments should be instant, irrespective of where the originator is or where the ben beneficiary is based. All payments should be instant. That would be a first sentence, Renata. Write it down uh, as uh, one of the like the first five minutes outcome of this conversation. Keith, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with Tamer on two things there. One is, yes, all payments should be instant. And we can talk a little bit about why that's the case and why I think even more that than that's the case, I think that's the expectation now from consumers and businesses. But two is, I do think that there's a huge role for platforms like, like Plaid, like Tunes, like others to connect instant payment rails across countries and geographies. But if I look just within Europe, I think this upgrade for CEPA is actually integral to the future of open banking and open finance. And the reason for that is that I do think over COVID, people's expectations changed to want and desire instant connectivity and fully expect that. And so this is an upgrade on a very key system. And obviously, round-the-clock clearing is going to be key to making instant payments a reality for both small businesses and consumers within Europe. And so I think this is a really exciting development. I'm really excited to see it hit, I believe, in November of later this year. Um, but I also think that, it, you know, as again, as Tamara was saying, there's still a role for platforms to play in connecting these instant payment networks to each other. And I think that's still a large unsolved problem that I'm spending a lot of time thinking of on. And I know a lot of others in this room are as well. And so excited to see the, the core infrastructure here getting built in a way that I think can continue to help Europe be a leading player in the payments ecosystem in this world where we all expect things to be instant. Thank you, Keith. Uh, James, people are James. Yeah, happy happy to jump in. Um, I mean, I think from from my point of view, I mean, I agree with both of you. I think I think today consumers expect payments to be instant. Uh, consumers are becoming more and more demanding um, as as technology improves. But I agree. I mean, I agree with one point that Keith made, and that I think this is fundamental to Europe's uh, progress. However, there's still quite a few. Um, uh, there's a hurdles that we need to get over because I think this is just the starting point. You know, once you have the infrastructure that's instant, you still have to build all of the different building blocks from all the way from the merchant side of the house to the consumer side of the house. And you know, you've got PSPs in the middle, you've got acquirers in the middle, you've got different banks, you know, and you need to get everything in line in order to create that seamless payment experience. So we've seen it implemented extremely well in, in certain use cases around the world. And another use case is it takes years to still get real instant payments um, from an end-to-end -end perspective, because there's the payment of flow you need to account for. There's a different platforms, a different technology that you need to account for. There's uh, AML transaction monitoring um, elements that you need to account for that in some cases are, are not instant today. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to sound negative about it. I think it's extremely exciting. But I think as, as payment professionals, we've still got quite a bit of work to really create an, an instant settlement network uh, um, within Europe. James, uh, do you want to like a comment, uh, uh, like add, add something or, or uh, yeah, I mean, have to go to the next topic? We have a lot to discuss. Yeah, just, just very quickly to echo the previous comments. I mean, it's many ways it's like looking back 20 years in terms of uh, telecoms. You know, it used to be. Uh, expensive and, and slow to make calls internationally and it's going to be pretty much the same with payments eventually where it will be uh, probably near free and instant so it will get there but to James's point there's a lot of moving parts and it has to be compliant as well so I'm with him I, I think we, we all get there but it will take a little bit longer and there's a lot to learn still. Thank you James actually I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you to, to kick off the the next topic and and in this i want to call it uh, another type of acceleration you know so we talked about the acceleration from uh, uh, minutes to seconds okay it's an acceleration uh, in time and uh, uh, there is also another acceleration uh, is uh, in uh, adoption so and and uh, certainly helped by uh, you know the the what happened in the world in the past uh, uh, 24 months uh, at least, but clearly, like uh, digital payments are uh, uh, overtaking cash as uh, the most popular, like uh, in-store, you know, uh, type of payments. And you know, I'm Italian. If you haven't figured by the accent uh, right now, and even Italy, you know, that is considered like one of the worst dinosaurs 
in terms of digital uh, payments. At least this is how me as an Italian can claim to call it. This is my own ecosystem. So whatever, take it for granted. You know, they even like got they got a law that obliged every single store in the country to accept digital payments. They enforced it only less than 36 months ago. You know, then of course uh, uh, COVID accelerated all uh, all that. But uh, uh, what other drivers is this uh, other acceleration uh, bringing to the to the market, James? Yeah, you're you're, you're absolutely right, Matteo. I mean. I think there's a lot of data out there um, suggesting that we probably saw about 10 years worth of uh, acceleration on digitization of, of um, money uh, in just a few months as a result of COVID. And a lot of that was really because it was so critical for businesses of all sizes and from all verticals and geographies, not only to sell online, but to serve an international market. I mean, geographical diversity has always been a great path for growth, but Facing unpredictable changes to both supply and demand as a result of the pandemic, global growth is a critical risk management strategy as well. Um, Ensures redundancy in supply chains and customer base. Interestingly, we saw in many ways the developed markets during the last couple of years are are the ones catching up with the emerging world, not the other way around. So markets which traditionally focus on the strong domestic economy or imports like the UK and US, We've also seen the benefits of taking part in the global expert economy. So as consumers all over the world get more comfortable with buying goods and services across borders. Uh, and in contrast, you've got markets like China, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, India. I mean, they, they've been long way in export of uh, um, goods and services. And, and you've seen with the entry of PayPal in India, for example, that's caught a lot of attention recently. And we've been in India for quite a long time and it's it's not straightforward it's uh we actually entered india um and had to exit in 2011 and and re-entered in 2016 when we managed to get our uh, product right and and understand the complexity and the regulations a lot better so it does take us to quite a critical issue that uh, more and more businesses move towards digitization uh, and the accompanying opportunities expand globally regulatory compliance and multi-jurisdictional complexity has got to be a priority for these businesses Yes, yeah, so open banking helped a lot as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's helping a lot with uh, younger companies getting to market quicker. You're right. Keith, actually, yeah, that, that was also it was so like an asset for you. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think I think there's a, a couple important things to sh- to share around this topic, and um, I can share some stats that I love as well. So, so 2020 was an important year for payments. And there are two stats I love to lean on for this. One is it's the first time on a global basis in history that digital payments overtook cash at point of sale as a form of payment. And this is obviously because COVID led to all these lockdowns. But I think it accelerated a trend that was already happening there. And in the UK, in fact, mobile wallets were used more uh, for online payments than debit cards in 2020 for the first time as well. So you're seeing this real shift in how consumers are making payments. And I think a couple of important things there. One is I mentioned earlier it's an acceleration of something that was already happening. So we saw this step change, but that trend was already underlying this movement. It just pushed it forward by a few years. And the other thing now is consumers have more choice than ever at point of sale to how they make a payment. And so I think where we're headed now is to a world where consumers will use a digital wallet. They'll connect financial accounts via open banking to help power that wallet. But they will ultimately have this wallet with a whole wealth of ways to pay online. And they're going to expect the highest converting, easiest UX to make that happen. And so I think, uh, again, that's what we're witnessing happen. And COVID just pushed that ahead by several years. But it's really exciting how fast this change is happening. Um, We did our own survey in 2021 of of users in the US and the UK. And we found that 86% of Brits now use a digital wallet to manage and spend their money, which is a huge percentage. And so I do think that we're we're now in this sort of new world for payments. And uh, it's exciting to watch how it's developing. So before before Tamer and, and, and James sort of jump in, uh, we 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 mentioned twice already. It would be interesting also if you have an opinion on that uh, to uh, to sort of distinguish whether or not this acceleration of digitization of payments is something that has two different speeds in emerging markets versus uh, mature markets, right? And then because the the uh, we've we've been mentioning that uh, the difference between the, like the starting point in these two ecosystems 
and, and maybe also the out of necessity, you know, the, the, the loosening of some of the regulations might sort of make us talking differently, you know, among these two markets. Uh, Tamer, uh, you know, jump in. Look, I, I, it's been referenced a couple of times already that it, it is a fact that the pandemic has accelerated um, a shift to cashless payments and boosted alternative payment methods, such as mobile wallets. Um, a number of the of the studies and, and, and stats referenced uncover that um, beneficiaries of such a shift are different around the world. In some cases, it's card-based payments uh, like an Apple Pay or a Google Pay. But in many others, it's the proliferation of mobile wallets. It comes back to your point just a moment ago, Matteo, about how, what's the difference in impact uh, on developed markets versus um, faster growing e- economies. Um, in fact, the GSMA estimated that over 1.2 billion mobile money accounts were created during the pandemic. So, um, you know, along the lines of some of the things that that Keith was referencing there as well. It, in the world of payments, APMs, alternative payment methods, are going to start to play a critical role connecting e-commerce merchants with local buyers. We're a big believer of that. Um, and global payment companies like Tunes, um, our collections arm, and PPro, we're working to address um, a number of these things to stay you know, ahead of the game. Um, speaking on behalf of people here, but I'll, I'll pass on the, the mic. Uh, but these are, these are some of the things that I think are important to us as we build out alternative payment method networks and connections to serve the likes of people who have wallets in a market like a Kenya uh, with an M-Pesa who don't have a bank account or a debit card or a credit card or might actually be bypassing cash as a primary method of making payments. So connecting to those methods and offering those methods to merchants around the world is a big play that we think um, you know we're focused on and betting on. I mean, just to just to jump in there and add on that, I mean, I I I can't agree with you more. I think you've done you've done all the talking for me here. But I mean, I, I mean, what what I can say from from our side, or at least what we're seeing at Pepper, is I agree with you. The trends depending on on where you come from in the world, be it Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa, Europe, dramatically differ. But I think what's what's the common thread is we're seeing an adoption of just digital first commerce. Um, and that can be a cash-based payment method. You know, there's still cash-based payment methods in Africa and Latin that we're seeing increased adoption versus physical, let's say, cash in hand at a store. Um, what what I find quite interesting is, is you know, I, I look at all the trends coming out of emerging markets or frontier markets because that's where I can see a lot of the leapfrogging happening. You know, you've got a consumer base that's not tied onto legacy methods of payments. I mean, that's why Europe, the UK, the US were probably quite slow to adopt, uh, I mean, even QR codes. You, you look back a few years, Southeast Asia, QR codes were popping up everywhere. They didn't really take off um, in the UK or Europe that well. I mean, now they're everywhere. Now everybody's using it. I think consumers are getting more comfortable with using iPhone or Android devices. You look at everybody in your family, everybody's comfortable with using the technology, which means that they can interact with digital forms of payments much better. And now you look at these emerging economies where they literally don't have any of the, the constraints of legacy infrastructure. You know, they can always implement kind of best in class services, best in class uh, payment experiences that I think that the rest of the world will will look at and they'll be surprised at how quickly they um, they catch on. So I apologize in the meantime, you have a little bit of the background noise, but I am in Abidjan recording this show and there is a storm outside. So I hope that, uh, uh, you know, literally I, I hardly have seen so much water uh, uh, floating around me. So I hope that uh, uh, you know maybe our our audio professionals will do will do the rest. So last topic, okay? Before uh, we do a short uh, a short break, I think uh, we would be lying to ourselves uh, if uh, we said that uh, by now failure and uh, the the intertwining between the payments and credit uh, is not a thing, right? And it's not something that. Uh, has to be talked in this uh, in this format. Uh, I, I, you know, starting with uh, James uh, Allen, uh, you know, how this uh, uh, like non-financial players 
enabled by guys like you, you know, can uh, sort of open a new or, or, or widen the horizon, you know, in the in the in the payments and the and, and the credit space. And I go back on news to for you guys to get ahead of you. Sure, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the main topics um, in this space at the moment is the, the whole buy now, pay later trend. Uh, I think I was reading earlier that 40% of micro SMEs have unmet credit demand for a total value of about 5.2 billion, which is uh, 1.4 times the total value of lending to them today. Um, and there are you know, some, some really interesting things happening almost on a daily basis, but it speaks to some wider trends. Um, one of which is globalization. So buy now, pay later really isn't new. In Germany, it's been a common method of payment for over 60 years, especially in retail and fashion. And now its popularity is boosted largely by the digitization of commerce and is spreading throughout Europe, US and the rest of the world. And then the second point would be an increasing, increasing focus on choice. Um, consumers want to be able to choose how they pay and when they pay. And they want flexible and tailored pay, payment experiences. Uh, and then there's a, a link to that is a general need for alternative lending. Traditional finance institutions kind of built their offerings and, and tools with analog business models in mind. And their understanding of this new digital uh, economy um, isn't really aligned with the reality. Um, and then there's a few challenges um, linked to this, though, that we, we shouldn't get too carried away. Um, I mean, first of all, getting the buy now, pay later propositions to the customers. So there's some technical elements in, in trying to get this uh, integrated into platforms. Uh, we work, for example, with people like Klarna and Afterpay um, to create what we call a payment orchestration platform to take some of that heavy lifting away from, from end clients. Um, but then there's the clients themselves. I mean, the, these um, retailers have a need for capital just like consumers. And we're seeing some interesting trends here in the um, B2B space where... It, it's not quite straightforward as uh, extending by now pay later. Um, they have slightly different needs. They actually want to reinvest um, into a lot more than loading up inventory ahead of peak seasons. They want to do things like invest in advertising, market expansion, human resources. Um, and, and there aren't many models out there that suit this. So there needs to be this flexibility. In, and that's why we've been working quite hard on solutions like our working capital proposition um, to be able to try and address this. I'd love to just chime in and talk about it. I think this affordability point, uh, which ties to buy now, pay later, is such an important trend that we're seeing. Um, and this is one where I think, in particular, open banking shines, because not only do you allow instant payments, but you can verify the affordability of the consumer instantly based on them choosing to share their banking data via a link account linking process. And so I think this is one where you're starting to see a shift where rather than having a lagging view of consumer credit that's built on your ability to pay back from six months ago. I think what we saw again, COVID change is that people want to be able to be accessed, to have their affordability assessed instantly at point of sale. And I think that's something where your current account or your checking account actually provides an immense value here. And so I do think we're going to start to see more and more use of open banking at point of sale to help power some of these instances. Um, but I agree that it's it's early days for this shift and it's going to happen I think in in certain particular consumer segments first before it becomes something broader. Um, I mean, yeah, I, gr I agree completely with James and Keith. Uh, I think there's there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of um, excitement coming out of the buy now pay later space. Uh, I mean, we see it on people's side. We see almost every every month or every quarter we see a new player entering the market. Um, I think the market as a whole is going to become a lot more fragmented before uh, things start to become a little bit clearer. I mean, we're, we're, we're even starting to see buy now, pay later aggregation solutions popping up, um, effectively orchestration layers solely focused on buy now, pay later um, solutions for consumers. Um, that mixed, I think, with, with uh, what Keith was talking about with uh, open banking rails, I think helps just clean up the whole solution. I think there's going to be a lot of work happening behind the scenes to do, yeah, effectively make the consumer experience much more clean and much more slicker when it comes to these new new forms of payments. Thank you, James. Sam, have anything to add? Uh, just, just very short. Um, we're not as directly involved in uh, buy now, pay later. But two two quick comments. One, uh, a shameless plug for our sister company, Lentech, um, that is a um, 
micro lending uh, business, particularly in emerging markets in Africa. And it is an extension. Uh, of buy now pay later, but in a very different segment uh, of the population. Uh, everything in, in many things in, in in emerging markets are paid for in a prepaid manner. Uh, your phone is uh, prepaid. If you run out of uh, data service, uh, you have one of two choices: you go to the kiosk around the corner, buy a uh, an additional top up, or you could enjoy a loan from an organization like Lentech, and then you pay that at, at a later point. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, uh, um, ways that uh, that we m- measure the creditworthiness of the customer, millions and millions of data points, et cetera, around that. So that's one. Uh, from from the perspective of uh, of tunes, um, I would say that um, again, the buy now, pay later, B two B is behind in terms of payment innovation. Um, so moving a little away from uh, buy now, pay later, and uh, this is while payments are one of those most fundamental business needs. Um, We're ramping up our offering in the B2B and SME segments, and we'll be announcing products and enhancements and partnerships in in this year and next year to support that. Uh, But the point is B2B has some catch up to do in terms of B2B flows compared to B2C, especially when it comes to the space. Okay, guys, it's time to wrap up this uh, kickoff of uh, breaking payments. Thank you, Pioneer, Pipro, Tunes, uh, and Plaid uh, to be with us. Uh, thank you to the two James, uh, Keith, uh, and Tamer for their excellent uh, um, insights, and uh, stay tuned. Thanks for listening to Breaking Banks Europe, a Provoke Media podcast in cooperation with Fintech Stage. Don't forget to tweet us out, shout out, or post to the team at Breaking Banks EU on Twitter. If there's something or someone you'd like to hear on our cast, let us know. See you next week on Breaking Banks Europe.